Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Michael Waterstone, and I am the dean here at the UCLA School of Law. I'm honored to welcome you to this terrific event today, and it's wonderful to look out and see all of your faces. Before we continue, I want to acknowledge the native people on whose land UCLA sits. As a land-grant institution, UCLA and the law school acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We pay our respects to our ancestors, elders, and relatives, past, present, and emerging. Thank you. The Burkle Center's annual Brody Lecture on the Conditions of Peace is always a major event on the UCLA calendar. This year, it's truly special. We're so pleased that Sana Marin, the former Prime Minister of Finland, agreed to take the time to travel here and participate in this lecture. Of course, we are all familiar with Prime Minister Marin from her recently concluded tenure as Finland's head of government from 2019 to 2023. When she started in that role at age 34, she was the youngest state leader in the world. And she served her country, especially through the COVID-19 pandemic with enviable skill, strength, and character. Her work was a true inspiration to millions of people, particularly to girls and women of all ages around the world. As someone who helps train the leaders of tomorrow at UCLA Law, I can say that providing the kind of encouragement to our future lawyers and statespeople is absolutely invaluable. Thank you for your service and for the terrific example that you have presented throughout your career. Cal Rostiala, my colleague, will offer a more complete introduction in a moment, but I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank Ambassador Oka Pekka Salminis, the Consul General of Finland in Los Angeles. Our deepest thanks for your efforts in bringing us together for this special event today. And I also want to recognize, I believe he's here, UCLA Chancellor Emeritus Al Carnsdale, who joins us today. There he is. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you for coming. So now let me turn things over to my colleague, Professor Cal Rostiala, who directs the Burkle Center, and my colleague on the law faculty. Thank you again, everybody. Okay, thanks, Michael. Is this on? Everyone can hear me? Great. So welcome, everyone, here and online to the 2023 Bernard Brody Lecture on the Conditions of Peace. The UCLA Burkle Center for International Relations has been doing this lecture for over four decades. We've had many illustrious speakers over the years, from President Jimmy Carter to Japanese Prime Minister uh, Yasuhiro Nakasone to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Last year, our speaker was Luis Moreno Ocampo, the first prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Our topic has always been peace and security. This lecture was inaugurated during the Cold War. And while conflict in the world has ebbed and flowed, today we unfortunately live in darkened times. War is raging in many parts of the globe, and perhaps no conflict has raised uh, more questions about the future of the post-war order than Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Having just returned from Europe, indeed from Finland, I can say that while the war might seem far away here in Los Angeles, it feels very close in Europe, especially in Helsinki. Our speaker today understands that threat uh, better than most. As Prime Minister of Finland, Sanna Marin shepherded Finland's historic uh, accession to NATO, reversing decades of Finnish foreign policy in the process. That decision took leadership, skill, and vision. As we'll surely get into, uh, there were many components. It was controversial, uh, but seen, I think, widely as crucial. Uh, as a first-generation American, my family emigrated from Finland after the Second World War, and indeed, my grandfather fought uh, Soviet troops in the Winter War. Uh, I'm personally thrilled to have Sana Marin here and to be able to talk with her 
about the conditions of peace in the world today and how we might achieve it. So in a moment, I'll properly introduce her. Let me just say a little bit about how the event will unfold. So uh, once I'm done, we'll invite Ms. Maureen on stage. She and I will sit in these chairs. We'll have a conversation about, obviously, peace and security, as well as many other issues about her premiership and tenure as a political leader. Towards the end, I will open it up to questions uh, from all of you and ideally from those who are watching on Zoom. So it's a bit of a hybrid. We're going to do our best to do that. Uh, so hopefully we'll have questions coming from both uh, live and online audiences. So just bear with me as we do that. If we call on you, or if I call on you, we have a microphone of some kind uh, that's a bit unusual. Alexander, am I right? No, we have normal, we have no microphone. Okay, we have no microphone. We were gonna have a box, I didn't really get it. I'm glad we're not using it. So speak loudly when you have a question. Uh, and please keep your questions short and to the point. We only have one Brody lecture today and it's Santa Marine. So we want short questions that she can answer uh, and address. So now let me introduce our guest. Santa Marine began her political career on the Tampere City Council in Finland. In 2015, she was elected to the Finnish parliament. And, in 20, and since 2017, uh, she served as a leader of the Social Democratic Party and eventually leader of the party. Chosen as Prime Minister of Finland in 2019, as Michael just explained, at the age of 34, she served as the youngest Prime Minister in the world. In that role, she led Finland through both the COVID pandemic as her kind of first challenge, uh, and then second, the war in Ukraine and Finland's joining of NATO. Ms. Marine's government also passed many progressive reforms in Finland, including some of the world's most ambitious climate laws, aiming for carbon neutrality by 2035, family leave reform, major reforms in healthcare, education, and human rights. Since leaving her position as prime minister, she has joined the Tony Blair Institute as a strategic counselor. And in this role, she'll specialize in geopolitics, strategic autonomy, and female leadership. Santa Marine has been actively engaged in politics since she was 21, if I have the math right. Uh, she has said, quote, being involved and making a difference represents civil rights for me. Changing things takes commitment. The welfare state or the ground rules for working life should not be taken for granted. They're the result of hard work and determined efforts. The first in her family to go to college, Ms. Marine holds a master's degree from Tampere University. Uh, throughout Scandinavia, she is widely seen as an inspirational figure, especially for young people, girls, and women interested in politics. So it's an honor to have her here today for the Brody Lecture, and please join me in welcoming her on the stage. Really? You need that? Everyone yours, okay? Yeah, we're fine. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we're going to start with the book. So the Cold War, I'm, I'm going to presume that there's um, not a lot of knowledge about Finnish foreign policy or Finland in the room, but I'm running, so I'm going to practice some of that with you a little explaining the difference. But one of the things about the Cold War was it was a difficult time for Finland. Uh, Finland was kind of part of the Russian Empire, and throughout the Cold War was sort of forced to use a lot of uh, extremely lost circumstance. Um, that is part of what made the situation. So, so I guess my first question is, tell us a little bit about how you would like to send them into me. Or was it really the Finnish people? Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so great to see you all three of you today. Uh, we will quickly talk about the corporate you know, application, but there are also many different things. And, and the reason why Finland joined NATO, the reason is quite simplistic. Because the war in Ukraine, the Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, uh, February on scale, but we didn't anticipate that nobody wanted to speak. And this did different change the Finnish mentality, what also may have rendered it overnight, I would say so. 
before the war, a uh, majority of Finnish people, a majority of the parliamentary parties, a uh, majority of the Finnish government, uh, the president, all the Finnish institutions uh, weren't very vocal about Finland turning mayor. Uh, as for the opposition, we always have this consensus when it comes to foreign and security policy, and we paper on foreign and security policy that's been widely parliamentary, also uh, in line with the opposition, so in their governmental uh, paper, but the paper for the whole um, scope of different parties in the uh, parliament, and it said that Finland will have the possibility to join NATO if it choose. If things change, we have the possibility to join NATO. And we were, uh, of course, very close partners to NATO even before the war, even before the accession, but, but we didn't um, have that in our governmental programs or we can be institutions um, table that, that we didn't even put on uh, NATO. So is there something wrong with my question? <laughs> 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 I can't tell you. All right, it's now working. But, but we have the possibility, um, and it was written that we have the possibility to bring out a we do so, and things have to change. But before the war, we didn't have that consensus. But after the war started, it was evident that Finland will have this process ahead of us. And the reason is quite simple. Uh, we have had wars with Russia uh, before, uh, and we've been the Finnish DNA. And the most important thing to be citizens, uh, every citizen, we should make sure that we are safe, our country is safe, we are independent, that we will secure our own society. Uh, and up to that point, uh, the way to secure our society and, and make sure that we are safe uh, as, as a country, uh, where to have working relations with our big neighbors, Russia, uh, to work this kind of position in the middle of the East and the West. Of course, Finland is a member of the European Union and our um, path has always gone toward the West. But we also have the difficult uh, task with, with Russia. So after, I don't know if there's still uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's always technical. Yes, well, sorry, pardon me. Okay. Oh, no. okay. Good. No, 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 you can hear me. No, okay. yeah. Perfect. Oh. How nice. But so, did anyone hear any of that? <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of voice, but I think that, that nobody online heard anything. Okay. But, but you will get the point. We're just beginning. But after that point, we saw that, that there is no reason uh, in, in Russia's actions, uh, there's nothing that will keep us safe. Russia will use aggressive force towards its neighbors, so we couldn't anymore rely on that working relations, on anything. Uh, and then we have to ask ourselves the question, uh, what is the line that Russia wouldn't cross? And the only line that Russia won't cross is the NATO line. And this is the whole reason why Finland is now a member of, of So the NATO line is the only line that will keep us secure and safe in the future. And I have said before that actually Finland joining NATO was an act of peace. It was an act of peace to make sure that there would ever again be war in Finnish soil uh, like we have experienced before. So the war changed everything. It changed the whole mentality towards the alliance in Finland. The citizens, they changed and shifted their minds, I think very fast after the war started, and so did the politicians. So to answer your question, was it uh, that politicians led us to NATO or was it the citizens? I think it was both, uh, because we as politicians are also citizens of Finland, and like the citizens of Finland, also for us to keep our society, our country, uh, our future uh, safe and secure is to make sure that there won't ever again be war uh, in Finland. And it was also a very um, difficult process to have uh, when there was a full-scale war happening in Europe. 
uh, and we worked uh, through that process not only within the Finnish society but together with our uh, Western neighbor Sweden. So at the same time we had to make sure that everybody in Finland was on board, uh, of course the citizens, but all the political parties, all the institutions. We have this uh, two-headed um, uh, way of handling foreign and security policy. We have president in Finland that is leading foreign and security policy together with the government. So both of the institutions have a role and of course the parliament are in top uh, and making the final decisions on everything. So we had a process that happened actually in quite many levels at the same time within the government, with the president, with the parliament, but also all the parties because ma majority of the parties were before against NATO membership and then they have to shift uh, that uh, and make new decisions within the parties and in the parliamentary groups. Uh, and together uh, with Sweden as well, so we spoke, I think, almost every day with the, I spoke with the uh, Swedish Prime Minister, uh, then Magdalena Andersson, then James Stolz Kristarsson, which is now uh, the Prime Minister of Sweden, uh, and of course our uh, ministers of, of defense or of for foreign affairs were in touch with their Swedish colleagues every day. So the process happened in, in many different places at the same time and there was no manual how to enter and how to have that process and discussion within the Finnish society while there is a war in Europe, uh, the fear of perhaps escalation, how it will affect Ukraine, how it will affect Europe uh, and at the same time I felt that it is so important to have that process at that time because we don't want to see uh, a situation, and it was my biggest fear, and I'm so sorry to say this out loud, but I'm no longer the Prime Minister, so I can be quite frank. Uh, my, like, the worst scenario that I could think of at that time, uh, when we were uh, thinking, is this the right moment to have this process in Finland? The worst scenario that I could have to think of is that we have Russia and Putin at the other side, and then, perhaps in the future, when you will have your election, we would have Trump in the other side. And small countries like Finland or Sweden in the middle, it would be a very difficult situation. We wouldn't know how these uh, leaders uh, might act uh, in, in, the, in that, si uh, in that uh, kind of situation. So of course the Biden administration uh, and the, the foreign and security policy of the states uh, was so important uh, as well when we had this, this um, ground from through thinking uh, within our society. But it was very difficult. It was difficult uh, to handle that process in so many levels together with Sweden uh, when there was war uh, in Europe. But it looked from the outside actually quite coherent. We did all the steps in a very um, uh, mannered way uh, and actually quite fast. I think this is the one of the fastest or the fastest uh, accession to NATO that we have ever witnessed uh, and hopefully Sweden will be a uh, member of NATO as soon as possible. There are some <coughs> problems with Turkey, with Erdogan and also with Hungary that haven't yet passed Swedish uh, NATO uh, bit uh, or passed that. Passed that um, but hopefully that will happen soon. I will also tell you if you will ask why is this, I will tell you, uh, but, but not maybe a few uh, questions later. Okay. Um, but now I'm very happy that we are a member of NATO and, and we are also a very strong member because we have quite extensive military force in Finland because of our history, even though we are a country of 5.5 million residents. Unlike many European countries, we have made sure that we have uh, big armed forces, we have made investments uh, in our uh, military equipment, for example, during our governmental period, we made a decision of purchasing uh, 64 um, F-35 fighter jets uh, to Finland to renew our, our fleet. We will be renew our fleet uh, when it comes to uh, fighter jets and also made decisions on, on new uh, fleet on, on uh, boats and ships. So, so we have made sure that we are capable. If there will be war, we are capable, so we are actually quite um, good partner in, in NATO. Yeah. Great. Okay. So many things there. There's a lot of. Um, I can continue. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> how, how much time? 
time. We have a lot of time. There's a lot of questions I have to follow up on that. But let me ask the, I guess, the first question. Uh, so I was last week in Finland at the Helsinki Security Forum, where mm -hmm. I think you spoke the year before. And the Prime Minister of Estonia uh, said at one point that defense is not escalation, weakness is escalation. Mm -hmm. So do you agree with that? And do you think that it's essential for countries in Europe today, whether in NATO or not, uh, to build up their strength and to become, you know, one of the big issues in NATO, of course, is whether countries, member states, are spending sufficiently on defense. Uh, do you agree with that sentiment that weakness is, in a sense, provocative? I agree. I agree. And then, at the same time, we have to ask ourselves the question, uh, what is the escalation that we are waiting for? There is a full-scale war in Europe happening today. So what is the escalation? There is already escalation. I don't think that we should allow fear uh, of escalation or fear of authoritarian country or their mad leader affect our decisions. I think we should always do what is right. And the right thing to do is to make sure that Ukraine will win the war. But it's not only crucial for Ukraine to win the war. This war is happening in Ukraine, but it's so much wider. It affects all of us. Uh, we are seeing this fight on values going on in the world uh, as we speak. There are more and more authoritarian regimes that are questioning our democratic values that are acting in a way that it's not um, in any sense uh, acceptable. Uh, and the war is, the, of course, the ugliest um, uh, performance of, of that way of thinking. So I totally agree with Kaja Kallas, uh, the Estonian prime minister, uh, on that. We should be more strong. We shouldn't so show any weakness. Uh, Russia don't respect anything but strength. If we are seen we as weak, uh, then they will only continue. And this is why it's so important that Ukraine will win the war and that Russia will lose. It's not enough that there will be some kind of peace. Ukraine should win. They should gain all the land, the territory that is theirs, and Russia should really lose. I don't think that there should be any kind of face-saving end for Putin of this war. I think Putin and Russia should lose the war, and that's, uh, that's the most um, uh, that we could get uh, out of this. Uh, if they would feel at all that they have won, something. They will continue. Next it will be Moldova, then it will be Western Balkans, then they will gaze on Baltic countries. So I, I, I truly believe that we should do everything we can to support Ukraine, militarily, monetarily, financially, uh, also giving humanitarian aid, uh, taking refugees, anything that they need. And we should make sure that the end, end of this very stra uh, sad and tragic events there will be a prosperous future for Ukrainians, that they will become member of European Union, that they will become member of NATO as well. And actually, if we look at Europe and NATO, Ukraine would be the most strongest uh, in, within NATO. They are the ones that have the experience of war uh, today. They have uh, extensive uh, military forces. They have that experience, and we truly, I, I believe, uh, we need them in the future. So we need to make sure that, that the future for Ukraine and Ukrainians are bright and good, and the future for these kind of authoritarian regimes, for Putin and his fellow men, are not good. So if we want to uh, make sure that we are living in a peaceful world, uh, then we should really build up our own capabilities when it comes to defense, when it comes to secure our societies, and we should show strength, not weakness. So you fully support Ukraine joining NATO? I fully support Ukraine uh, in their path towards European Union membership and also NATO, yeah. Okay. Do you think in 2014, when Russia invades Crimea, should the West, should Europe have been more aggressive then? Absolutely. Absolutely, and I have said this also uh, before, for example, in the Munich Security Conference, uh, uh, was it this year or early this year, that we made a big mistake in 2014. And I think we should be honest, look ourselves in the mirror uh, as Western countries, as Europeans. Uh, we should look ourselves in the mirror and, and <coughs> 
say that, yeah, we made mistakes. We wouldn't be in this situation, we wouldn't have war uh, in Europe, or it would be much less unlikely to have this kind of situation in Europe right now if we would have acted differently in 2014. Then we didn't show strength. We didn't show strength. Uh, there wasn't so heavy sanctions put in place. There wasn't actually that kind of reaction from the international community, from the European Union, from nobody, that this was wrong. Everybody just was like, well, okay, this is a very sad incident, but let's continue business with Russia and let's continue with the uh, energy supply that comes from Russia uh, and let's continue our lives as it was. And this is so sad that Crimea was lost, but like, let's move on. Some sanctions, some reaction, but not the reaction that should have been there. If we, should, if we would have uh, acted more strongly in 2014, I don't think that Putin ha would have had that idea that he can just repeat that. I think that he really thought that he could just walk uh, across uh, Ukraine, straight to Kiev, change the government uh, for a pro-Russian uh, government, take the country over, and it would be like handle, like that. In a couple of weeks, special military, military operation, as he calls it. So this was his idea, and he really thought that the Ukrainians would welcome him, open-armed. And they were really surprised when the Ukrainians said that no way, we are fighting to the end. Uh, and they really uh, resisted uh, the, the invasion uh, of the Russians. And the Ukrainians, they are fighting every day, so bravely, so strongly, they are united. And I'm also <coughs> so proud that this time that this happened, we were much more prepared for the situation and rise on the occasion than before. We were able, uh, for example, um, to agree on, on many sanctions beforehand, European Union, together with United States, together with Great Britain. So there were already sanctions to put on place straight away. We uh, gathered, uh, convened, straight uh, after the war to make these decisions. Also, different countries make decisions on armed deliveries that were unthink of before. For, exa for example, Germany. Uh, it was a big shift for the Ger Germany's policies uh, to send arms to Ukraine because of their history of the Nazi Germany and, and very difficult history that they have. So it was a major shift that they would have sent arms to Ukraine and provide this kind of help. Uh, so we were more prepared than before, but it would be better not to have war than to have one. So yes, we made mistakes 2014. I don't blame. It's not like a blame game. I, I don't believe in that. It doesn't help anything. And of course, there has been reasons why we have acted the way we have as Western countries. Um, but now we have to realize that we don't get the logic, or we haven't get the logic of our territorial regimes and leaders. We have thought, and it's very logical, we have thought that creating very tight economical ties with Russia uh, on energy, on gas, for example, or on different matters, creating these very close economical ties, it would prevent the war, because it would be so costly, it would cost so much money, uh, and everything, international relations, uh, that the war will ever happen. But this is our logic. This is our logic. It's not the Russians' logic. They think different things. Ideology, they think that Great Russia is the Great Russia, and, and then uh, everybody that don't understand that, they can just like run over. So they have different logic than we do. So there was a logic, but we have made mistakes. Um, many, many mistakes, and we should have listened to our Baltic friends, Estonia, uh, Latvia, um, Lithuania, and also Poland, uh, and others that has been under Soviet control, under Soviet power, because they know the Russian logic, they know uh, how they think. And if we had listened to them uh, before, uh, then we would have been even more prepared for this situation. And now we have to wake up, like everywhere in the world, as democratic countries, we have to wake up and realize that these are authoritarian regimes, these leaders, they don't think like we do, they don't have the same logic, and that we 
that's why I agree with Kaya Kallas uh, that said that we should show power and strength, not weakness, uh, because this is the only thing that these leaders understand. Great. So you sort of answered your own point. You said along the way you didn't want to blame, but that there were reasons why perhaps in 2014 we didn't have the proper reaction that we should have with hindsight. <clears throat> So you reverted to kind of the interest in economic connections and thinking that maybe that would, would forestall conflict. Is there more to it? I mean, how would you just explain how you think people in 2014 misapprehended so badly Russian intentions? Well, there are many reasons. Um, I have referred uh, to Mr. Fukuyama's uh, concept of end of history. This was something that we thought before that after the world wars, uh, this market-based democracy would bloom and, and everything would just go forward and, and uh, progress would happen. Uh, and it was that after the wars, there would be end of like this kind of ideology thinking. But this didn't happen. Uh, we are seeing um, these are authoritarian countries. Russia is not the only one. Of course, we know also uh, many problems with, with China uh, and also others um, that think very differently uh, and that the market-based uh, um, uh, and uh, like rule-based order, they, it just don't continue but actually there is a backlash happening uh, right now um, and we need to understand that, that uh, in order uh, to, to survive in, in this different field and different surroundings, we have to face the facts, stop being naive. It's very hard for people and for leaders to do that, because people always want the future that they want. They want to believe that we can continue uh, as we are, we can continue trade, we can continue the economic growth, we can continue the things that they are, because it's convenient for us. It's convenient. It's nice, we want a bright future, we want everything to stay as it was, um, and then we don't want to face the facts that actually the world is a much uglier place and that there are uh, countries and leaders that think very differently than we do. And we don't change our views perhaps um, early enough, but only at the point where we have to. And this is what happened with Ukraine. And in the future, when we are looking forward, uh, one of my biggest worries that I've also spoken a lot of uh, through the concept of European strategic autonomy or open autonomy uh, is to do with new technologies. If we don't realize uh, fast enough that we cannot be dependent on these new technologies, the digital world, on authoritarian countries, uh, then we are really screwed. Our societies are digitalized already. In the future, we will be totally digitalized. Everything from schools, from transportation, from our hospitals, from our security, for, ev for everything. Everything will be digitalized. And we will need so much, these, so much of these technologies, whether it's AI, whether it's semiconductors or chips or, or quantum technologies or whatever. I'm not an expert on this, but, but still. Um, if we don't realize this soon enough, and if we have those dependencies on these authoritarian countries, whether it's China or, or whatever, then we really have uh, critical vulnerabilities in our society. And it will affect uh, also our decision making when it comes to foreign insecurity policy. For example, Russia is using gas and energy as a um, leverage uh, towards Europe during the war. Uh, they started actually uh, from energy, uh, 2021, uh, set uh, the, the whole fall, uh, they uh, cut uh, the export of energy and made sure that our storages were empty uh, when the war happened. And they have using energy as a leverage uh, and as a tool for war this whole time. And in the future when we are looking about technology, I'm certain that these authoritarian countries will use technology and all the parts uh, of that as a tool, as a weapon towards democratic countries if there would be some kind of incident. 
and that's why it's so important to realize how the world is today, to prepare for different kind of situations, to make sure that we also have those capabilities in the future by our own. So we need to tighten uh, cooperation between democratic countries, between European Union and the United States, Canada, uh, South America, also African countries, especially in Asia, Japan, South Korea, uh, also India and the whole in the Pacific region. We need to have those trading routes uh, between democratic countries. We need to have the capabilities to produce, to create, to innovate uh, new technologies and make sure that if something would happen, we will have that backup. So I'm not suggesting that we would like cut loose from China. It's not possible. We are so uh, interconnected already, but we need to prepare for different scenarios and different situations. In COVID, we noticed that we were too dependent on medicine, on medical supply, when it comes to certain uh, Eastern countries. Uh, during the war, energy is used as a weapon, and in the future, it will be a uh, new technology. So we need to prepare. And Finland is actually the country for preparedness. We don't want bad things to happen, but we are always preparing for maybe the world may take us to places that we don't really want to go, go and that's why we need to prepare for also for the worst scenarios. I want to come back to uh, finish uh, preparedness in a moment, but let me ask you just about the... Are we okay with the microphones? They're good, okay. Uh, I'm sure that you're not going to agree with Macron on this point, but he said in 2022, and others have suggested, that Ukraine could eventually undergo something like Finlandization as a end point to the war. I'm confident you don't agree, but can you first explain what Finlandization means to an audience that might not be familiar, and then why you either agree or disagree? Yeah, so Finlandization is a concept, or has been misunderstood historically from different countries, uh, and I can explain I've seen it. Uh, I'm not a historian, so may, there might be a better person to, to uh, explain this, but for Finland it has meant like um, self-control, self uh, before control uh, of, of making decisions. So we have always been aware of our big neighbor, and we have controlled ourselves and let that affect our own decisions um, uh, in different parts of, of society and in politics. So we have had this like before censure, censorship of our own, self-censorship of our own doings. So it's not a good concept. We want countries to be free. We want countries to make their own decisions in their own um, uh, perspectives. Um, we want to enhance that. We don't want to build Ukraine as a country that would make their decisions based on Russia or what might Russia do or what might Russia think. So I don't think or uh, support the idea that, that Ukraine should just like let um, uh, Ukraine be in this kind of middle ground, some kind of gray zone for Russia. I think that would be a mistake because then we would see a conflict rise again within five years or ten years. That's why it's also so important that Ukraine will win the war, gain the territory, and we should support Ukraine uh, for their own decisions. So Zelensky, the President Zelensky of Ukraine, has uh, uh, shown or, or given this um, peace plan of his own. I think we should support that. They need the global um, community support uh, widely. So they need, right now, they have said what they need, and what they want. They need arms. They need all the support for the society. They need to rebuild, not only after the war, but actually every day. There's been, for example, the infrastructure demolished every day. So they need to rebuild con constantly. Uh, so they need financial support. But then they also need the support of the international community for their peace plan. 
um, and I think we should support this. So it's their decision, and we should support. We shouldn't um, decide over them. And that's why I don't like that way of thinking of United States or France or Germany or European Union or anybody to discuss above Ukraine or, or uh, in the side of Ukraine. Ukraine should always be in the center. They should decide and we should support. Uh, if we don't uh, support them this way, uh, then for, for especially for a small country's point of view, the world is quite a dangerous place. If we don't have those rules, those international rules, uh, and, and um, values that we uh, promote, uh, then the smaller countries always lose, that don't have that leverage, that don't have that power, that don't have that extensive military force or anything. If we don't have those rules, if we don't support those rules, then the smaller ones will fail. Let me go back to uh, preparation. So you mentioned this briefly. When I was in Helsinki a couple of days ago, someone, I think maybe the mayor, referred to Finland as a nation of preppers. And I got to tour one of these underground, um, I don't know what you call them, but um, uh, they're like a bomb shelter, but more than just for bombs, they're for a place to hide. The population of Helsinki is 600,000, something like that, and there's room for many, many hundreds of thousands more in these. Every building has to have one. Uh, and there's enormous uh, complexes of this. This is an example of Finnish preparation, the level of preparation. Um, so tell us a little more about how Finland has prepared over the years. Uh, you mentioned you know, the military. For a moment, you can say more about that. Um, I brought up these shelters, but there's a lot of ways in which Finland is very prepared for conflict. So say a little more about that and why that's so significant. So how much time do you have? Because <laughs> it's actually uh, a quite complex and a multi-layered question. Everything starts when you are preparing for worst times. Everything starts at a uh, level of trust. If you have trust within your society, then you are prepared in very difficult situations. We saw this during, throughout COVID. We saw this throughout the war, uh, throughout the NATO accession. Uh, in this government, in our governmental period, um, so you need to have that level of basic trust in in your society. So when something happens, people listen to author uh, uh, authorities. They listen to government, to their leaders, to authorities. Um, uh, they can trust that if they're being told something, they can trust on that. So everything starts on that level. And how you build that trust within your society, uh, it, it doesn't happen overnight. You need all the structures of, um, from rule of law to democracy to freedom of press and speech and all the civil rights that you need to respect. Then we have been building for, for uh, decades the Nordic welfare system that people can trust in different situations in their lives. We have very good education system from early childhood to universities that don't have tuition. So the education is, is in core of Finnish society. Uh, we have made um, many, many reforms over decades uh, to en enhance equality so that women and men have the same opportunities in life. We have the social um, uh, and healthcare system and, and the social security system that enables people from different backgrounds to have uh, good and meaningful lives. So we have that Nordic welfare model, not only in Finland, but in Sweden, in, in, in Norway, in Denmark, uh, in the northern part in Iceland, in the northern part uh, of Europe. So that also builds that trust, that people from different backgrounds have the opportunities in life. And I have also said that actually the American dream that anybody can become anything, it's most reachable in Nordic countries because we have those uh, structures in our society uh, that I'm very proud of. And actually we made many reforms also during our governmental pre period uh, on that. And Finnish, 98% of our governmental program, even there was a pandemic and a war, and I'm very proud of that. Major reforms on education, on social health care, you name it. 
So you need that trust in your society to be, be prepared from different situations. If you have that trust, then uh, everything else can be built on that. And of course, there are the concrete things as well. We have those uh, shelters for our citizens if there would be bombings or if the war would, would uh, once again become reality. So we have all those uh, shelters for bomb shelters and shelters for people and, and we have this network of that. We have all the underground uh, pathways throughout Helsinki. I have also, as Prime Minister, went through those. and So you can get all the institution and decision, decision makers on the positions where if something would happen, we will still have that democratic process ongoing uh, and it cannot be in the um, And of course, we are prepared also from food security. For example, we have um, storage for grain and, and food and uh, medicine and uh, also we had storage for masks and everything like that before the COVID but when the pandemic happened we realized like straight away that yeah this is too little we need much much more so we weren't prepared enough but more prepared than many other countries so we have been preparing for many different uh, ways in many different um, scenarios from pandemics to war to, to uh, environmental crisis or, or um, different disasters that might occur or happen. So yes, Finland is a nation for uh, preparation. And when you look at war and peace, uh, we have mandatory military uh, in Finland for male. Uh, and uh, it's voluntary for women. Uh, hopefully in the future it would be more equal, uh, maybe some kind of um, system where everybody has to do something, uh, both women and men. Uh, you can do it in military or you can do that uh, on civil service or, or crisis uh, management or whatever. Do you support that? I, I support that, yeah, I support that. Um, and I think that will be in the future, but the time hasn't been right now, uh, right, right now, and we didn't introduce this kind of legislation throughout our governmental period. But we had that um, this group that were uh, thinking what should be done, uh, also parliamentary group uh, on that. So we have good military forces uh, in Finland. I think um, the wartime uh, capabilities almost 800,000 soldiers, uh, and that's a lot. Uh, and we have the reserve, uh, that is 200,000 or something. I'm sure I'm looking at the front row in our consulate, so... <laughs> 900 in total uh, wartime, and then 250. 250. 250 uh, so that's about 20% of the population. Yeah, so it's a lot. And our equipment are working. Like we're, <laughs> like really, we are seeing today when when different countries are sending um, material to Ukraine and they have gone through their uh, storages, what they have there, like tanks or whatever. Like many of those, they have that, but it doesn't work because they haven't made sure that that all the equipment are being taken care of. So actually, Finland, I think we have the like the biggest level of, of different kind of equipment from tanks to anything that actually works. So if, if something would happen, we would have that preparedness also within our uh, country. And hopefully rest of Europe as soon as possible. I was impressed in the shelters that one of the points that was made is they're not just dusty shelters. They're used, they're soccer fields, they're hockey rinks, they're uh, little bouncy houses for little kids to go play on the theory that you need to use these facilities at yeah. all times to make sure the lights work, that everything is operating, that there isn't a leak. It's very smart. So it was yeah, really- Yeah, and actually, yeah. Uh, one of these are uh, in a place called Hakaniemi. I have lived there throughout the last, uh, or the uh, when I served uh, as a parliamentarian, and we had our daughter, She's now five years old, and she was born through in, uh, during that, that period of time. And we spent a lot of time in one of these shelters. There was this kids' playground, 
uh, that was free under one year old. So she spent a lot of time there, like great place for uh, kids having fun and all kind of like trampolines and everything like in there. So yeah. Yeah, really impressive. Um, okay. So transition away from the war so I want because I want to talk about a couple of other things and then we're going to open it up um, so first what do you see as the biggest challenge for Finland for Europe right now aside from Ukraine so obviously that's overwhelming at the moment but taking that out of the equation we're at the tail end of COVID you can talk about COVID if you like but what do you see as the most important issue or issues uh, were you prime minister today or were you advising any other European leader well uh, there are many things, but of course, um, the biggest problem that we have is climate. Climate change, loss of biodiversity, uh, the transition that we need to make within our societies, in our economies. We have to make sure that we are working much more sustainable ways uh, in the future, and this has to be. Uh, this has to have. This has to happen throughout the whole societies, in every level in every part of the society. So of course, climate, loss of biodiversity. If, if we dismiss this, uh, or if we don't handle this, um, like right now, we will be in big trouble. Like that's a fact. So of course, um, we need that international aura. We need the agreements, uh, but we also, I'm an optimistic at the end, and I want to believe that even though we have, we have big problems ahead of us, and we are witnessing it right now, the, it, the heat wave here in Los Angeles, or, or the uh, wildfires everywhere in the world, or uh, problems in our environment in total, um, I still want to be an optimistic. I want to believe that we can solve these matters, uh, partly through our technology, working together and actually the war in Ukraine uh, gives us um, a reason and urgency also when it comes to reforming our energy system and network in Europe right now. We are building uh, so much more faster uh, sustainable energy network in Europe, uh, renewables, but also <clears throat> making sure that our grid storage and everything works much better in the future. So I want to believe that these kind of events that happen also gives us opportunities to perform better uh, when it comes to, for example, climate or, or biodiversity. So, of course, this is a big part uh, of, of the major challenges that we are facing. But also the technology that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is something that, that we really have to take serious. And it's super hard because these technologies, they are evolving so fast and the pace will only increase. So of course, I as a former politician wonder how the legislation, how our values, how, our, how the things that we keep uh, as granted today uh, will also be um, a reality in the future when it comes to AI or all the new technologies. And this is a tricky part. I don't have the solution because the technologies are um, innovated so fastly and, and um, evolved so fastly that, that the legislation never keeps uh, on track on that. I would only advise uh, to work much more uh, better together as private and, and public sector. We need more cooperation between these companies, uh, tech, tech companies, and legislators, and politicians, and institutions. Uh, I think we should work together. Uh, we shouldn't think that this future won't happen. It will. Uh, so I think cooperation is the key here as well. And, and still, like, we could end up on Terminator. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully not. Or some else, sci-fi future. So last question, and then I'm going to open it up. Uh, so technology, uh, you mentioned in a couple of different ways, uh, but it's also changed politics, the way politics works. And you as prime minister were pretty savvy about social media. You have a pretty big social media presence. 
I mean, I think if you compare the population of Finland to like your followings, like you probably might have the biggest. So um, how do you think that's, that technology has changed politics? How did it change it for you? And how do you think it's changing politics generally? Well, of course, social media changed, uh, has changed uh, and is changing the democratic system. Elections, for example, the recent elections in, in Europe have shown really that social media platforms, also disinformation, um, hate speech, everything affects massively also the outcomes of, of elections. I think you will see that here in, stage, uh, in states. Um, so all, already in last presidential elections, but I think these upcoming ones, it will only have more and more uh, effect. Uh, these different platforms and also misinformation and, and everything like this will be used. So it's a real problem for democracies um, and also for the participation of different people in the de decision-making process. We know already that women, for example, really think, can they enter political life? Do they want to take a stand? Well, when they get like intense hate online, like very violent, sexualized, very intense hate online. And the reason for this is happening is to silence women. The reason why this is happening is to make women think, can I enter political life? Can I take part on decision making when it will affect my life this way? And also different minorities. Uh, and this is, as a phenomena, it's not a new phenomena. We have always witnessed uh, hate against women, against minorities, against um, people from different religion. It has always been a tool for uh, some part of society to take control and, and gain power. But now the platform is totally different because it's online, it's on social media platforms. Uh, and many, many people think that, do they dare? Do, I, do they have the courage uh, to participate? And this is a big problem from the perspective of democracies uh, in the future. If many people think that I cannot participate or I don't have the strength to fight uh, on that kind of harassment, then we will be in trouble when it comes to uh, the democratic perspective. Yeah, and I'm also in social media. My, my advice to you is that don't read that. Like, don't, don't read or what is on X, what they say about you. Like, most of the accounts are bots. They're not real. There are like one person somewhere in the world, like keeping 20 or 50 uh, different accounts. And a lot of them are like bots, only like sending hate. Don't read that. They are only trying to silence you. Good advice. OK, so questions. Uh, so raise your hand. Again, we don't have mics. We have some. Thank you. Uh, so I always like to start with questions from students. So uh, student hands up. Let's start right over here. Try to speak uh, loudly. Hi, thank you so much for such an insightful discussion. Um, my question for you is, do you think undergraduate students and global university students should be considering the possibility of working in the private sector in the future? Of course. <laughs> of course you can. You can do so much uh, for the world. I believe that, that everybody of us has the, when we live in democratic countries, uh, we have the possibility uh, to make a difference. Of course, uh, the possibilities and opportunities are different for different people. It helps if you come from a wealthy family. It helps if you are male. It helps if you are white. Of course, we know that there are these structures within our society that put people on different positions when it comes to their vote or their uh, capability of, of, of making change. We shouldn't uh, ignore that. We should like realize that people have different um, positions when it comes to affecting, uh, affecting them uh, democratically. Uh, but still, I would say, of course, if you want to make a change in the world, you can, but it takes work. It takes work. It's not only like one post on social media. It's not like one like. It takes work. And I will give you an example. For example, the, the uh, 
many reforms that we did in our governmental period, from uh, parental leave or social and health care or education or uh, climate neutrality targets or you name it. It was an outcome of, of much uh, wider work that began a long time ago. I was still very young, uh, or younger than now. I worked in student politics, for example, or in the youth movement, and were participating in our party's program making uh, concerning these uh, reforms. We, we put those um, reforms or the aims or the targets like uh, 10 to 15 years in our programs and then worked throughout those. And when we won the election 2019, we wrote those in our governmental program. And now it's a reality. But it always takes time. Things don't happen overnight. And if we expect a change to happen overnight, then we can, can be very frustrated uh, that not to happen. So it takes a lot of work. Nothing happens immediately. So you really need to want things and, and work on things and, and commit the things to happen. But together, you have all the power. You have all the power. You can do anything. But you need each other as well. So if you I think, like, gather forces and, and do things. Other questions? Uh, wow, a lot of hands. Also, I'm going to go, I know I have some. Only one question. Sorry. One question per person. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Let me just briefly repeat the yeah. question. So the question, as I understood it, is we've seen pro-Russian governments come in. You mentioned Hungary, Slovakia. Uh, what can we do in the West, in Europe, uh, to address uh, pro-Russian sentiments coming out of those places? And perhaps implicit in that is should we do anything at all about that? Well, thank you so much for the question. I think this is a crucial one, uh, and it's very problematic. Uh, and I was mentioning that hopefully Sweden will enter NATO as soon as possible. And the key reason it's happening is because of Turkey, because of President Erdogan, um, that hasn't yet uh, passed that, um, uh, that, that membership, uh, not yet ratified. And the reason for that um, is, of course, that they want things. Uh, things from Sweden, change of the legislation on terrorism, which they have done already. So Sweden has uh, said, said that they would take. But also we know, and we knew uh, straight away, that there's also different things that Turkey wants. And this has been very profitable for President Erdogan. He had won an election. Um, he has used uh, Sweden as part of internal politics uh, from this uh, perspective. Uh, he has been able to negotiate on many things. I know that, and we know that they want to negotiate with the United States on uh, fighter jets, for example. So it has been very profitable for President Erdogan uh, to prolong uh, Sweden's accession to NATO. But um, the real problem is how does NATO look uh, when this 
when we let this continue. It doesn't look strong, it looks weak. Uh, and you referred to Hungary uh, and some other countries as well. So I think it's a big problem uh, when we have countries uh, within our European Union or NATO uh, that can act like this. But how to handle that? That's a much more difficult question. I don't have the right answer, but I have raised the question that, that some way we should have that discussion within the European Union, we should have that discussion within NATO. It's very, very difficult. I don't know how to handle that. But we also saw uh, in Russia that progress happening over time. Russia didn't just like land on war in Ukraine. It started uh, 15 years ago. First, uh, silent, silenting the opposition, uh, free press, media, civil society, making changes in the legislation. So Russia actually took very, very um, dangerous step during Putin's uh, period of president or prime minister and, and then president again. So the change happened over time. And the end of that change shift from, from a certain kind of Russia to this one authoritarian regime uh, happened during 15 years, 10 to 15 years. And we are seeing this same kind of progress happening right now in Europe. With more far-right parties, populistic parties, winning elections. Uh, Slovakia was one example, we, but we also had very close uh, uh, elections in Spain. Luckily, the far-right isn't uh, in government there. But, but we have uh, these, these uh, parties in government also in Nordic countries, as we speak. In Sweden, uh, the, the uh, Sverige Demokraterna, uh, the Swedish Democrats, they are not in the government, but the government works on their support, so they can influence a lot of the politics. In Finland, the true Finns uh, are in the government right now, together with the moderates or, or the conservative party. So, actually, the accession of, of this um, far-right parties happen uh, on the help of, of conservative parties in many cases. And in Hungary, we have seen this very worrying uh, development happening uh, over years. And if we don't stop this uh, process within European Union or within Europe, whether it is um, Hungary, Poland or some other countries that we are seeing this kind of worrying development, then in the future we might have this kind of, I don't know, maybe this is uh, not very nice things to say, but we will see this kind of mini Russians uh, within our communities, European Union, NATO. So we should have that discussion, but how? I don't know. I don't know. It's a very difficult one. Do you think there should be a test for who's in the European Union or NATO, that they need to be a liberal democracy and not only a democracy? This is also a very difficult question because of course we want and need Turkey with the NATO as its strategic position. And it's much better, even though these countries has problems, that we should address more uh, strongly we should address and have that discussion. I don't ha have the answer how to do that, but we should have that discussion and we should uh, make sure that this progress don't continue the way uh, that this, uh, it has uh, gone so far. But still, it's better to have those countries as democracies within uh, our um, discussion than outside. So Turkey, of course, would be much more problematic if it would be outside of NATO, even though it's problematic within NATO as well. <laughs> so, but we don't have like 100% good answers or good solutions in the world. We only have like solutions that are good and bad, like two sides of a coin. Okay, I'm going to go to a question from the overflow room. So uh, the question is, Finland uh, and Russia had 
uh, important or strong economic relations before the war. Um, what's been the effect since the war? Is there any trade? What is the kind of connection between the two countries now? Well, of course, we still have a long border with Russia, and this is a, a geological fact that we cannot ex escape, even though we would like to. Uh, I can only like, and I have said this also, that okay, we have Russia, but for example, Japan has China, Russia, and North Korea, so, so we are in better position. <laughs> um, but there are geological facts that we cannot uh, unseen. Um, we have cut, I think, uh, all of the energy supplies from Russia. Um, so no, we are not energy dependent. And as I said before, that we are country of preparedness. Actually, energy was one thing that we were prepared also with Russia. So we have been building renewables and we have been building our own energy security for a long time. So we weren't as uh, dependent on Russian energy than many, many other countries in Europe. So, so it wasn't as hard for us to cut those ties uh, fully, very fast, than, than many other countries are handling this situation right now. And we also uh, cut other economic ties and put all the sanctions in place, of course, as soon as possible. Um, there are still some problems when it comes to, I, I don't know, do I want to say these things out loud? Maybe the, the Russian know, of course they know already. Uh, but we are still somehow dependent on, for example, the uranium coming from Russia. We have nuclear uh, power plants in Finland that work on, on Russian uranium. And we need to change our reactors to use different kind of uranium in, in our reactors. So, so there are still some um, critical uh, matters, but we are handling this. We, we have uranium in our storage for a couple of years, and we are doing this uh, these changes uh, like we need to. So I wouldn't worry, but but still. Good. I don't think you gave anything away. They know. <laughs> they know, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to gather it's a couple a of common questions because yeah. we're at the, almost at the end. So uh, over here. Thank you very much for this uh, thought-provoking conversation. Um, the condition that the Russian army should leave Ukraine seems correct and non-negotiable. However, we have a fundamental problem with our international system. Russia is a permanent mm -hmm. member of the United Nations Security Council and is sitting sitting at the board of an organization that it seeks to destroy, or at least to in, in, inactivate. You know. um, this is not new, and uh, traces back to Joseph Stalin. But here, I would like to remind this example of the League of Nations in December of 1939, um, when the Soviet Union was expelled <coughs> from that organization after its invasion of Finland one month earlier. But today, in 2023, how we are going to solve this institutional deadlock? Don't answer just small yet. question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take one more, and then you can answer them yeah. both as you like. Uh, over here on the hat. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a Christian public policy student. I just want to say thanks for, for your talk. It's been really informative. You spoke a little bit about uh, resource dependence and energy dependence on Russia. Uh, there was a talk at the Brookings Institute about three weeks ago, and a fellow rose the point of integrating you know, international security goals with sustainable development goals. In the sense of Finland, like very quickly, I think under your watch, moved from Russian oil dependence to using you know, technologies that harvest no water or wind or, or I guess non competable uh, energy sources and that helped them you know gain some sort of self determination. Mm -hmm. um, there are other countries as you spoke about that are connected to Russia in the same way as you were uh, through oil or through uranium. Um, is there any sort of model that we can take from them, uh, 
uh, for other countries, other uh, or developing countries that are tied to you know erratic authoritarian regimes by way of resource dependence. Um, are there models in which they can integrate sustainable development as sort of a, a national security directive or, or something like that? Okay, let me briefly restate two very complex questions. So the, the, the second was about sustainable development and the SDGs, resource dependency, and how Finland's model of moving away from dependency on Russian uh, oil and gas might be a model for others. The first question was about the fact, pointed out the fact that the uh, Security Council has as its five permanent members uh, Russia, uh, and this is a really fundamental problem. Can we do something about it? And made the point of during the League era that uh, the Soviet Union was expelled. Could that happen again today? Could we do something about the Security Council today? Take those as you wish. Yeah, well, of course we should do something, but how? Uh, that's the problem. Uh, it's a real problem that, that Russia is a member, a permanent member of the Security Council. Of course it is. It's a it's so not logical to have a country that is in war in, in that uh, institution. Of course, we should do something, but how? That's another matter. Um, and it's a real pity uh, that the rule-based order that we uh, decided together uh, after the world wars uh, and all the goals that we had when it comes to human rights, rule of law, a democracy, the progress of the world are now being questioned more and more uh, and the international community is paralyzed uh, more or less. I think it's so important also for um, countries in Europe, uh, the states uh, and elsewhere uh, to have discussions and real cooperation and, and real understanding of, of uh, third uh, countries in, in Africa, also in South America, in, in Asia. Uh, I think we should build uh, real partnerships and, and understanding uh, and gain that trust from these countries because we know that Russia and China is, is using a lot of um, energy uh, and, and involvement in these countries trying to uh, persuade them from their perspective. So I think we should also use much more time within these countries to make sure that, that we are on the right track. But how to do that? If I, if I had these answers, I wouldn't be sitting here. I would be sitting somewhere else. Um, and then uh, the, the question, should we learn something from Finland? I think, yes, of course, we can learn something from Finland. I, I think we can learn many things from the United States. I think we can learn uh, from each other. Uh, but it's very important to realize that actually when it comes to energy policy or technology or many other fields, they are also fields of security. They are also fields of peace. Uh, they are also uh, fields uh, of, of keeping our society safe. So it's not only isolated part of society, for example, energy policy is, is uh, so important from also uh, the perspective of, of security. Not only energy security, but also uh, we are seeing like heavy power using this as a weapon. So it's another field that we should focus on. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're really glad to have you. I hope you come back to UCLA sometime. Thank you. Today. Thank you so much.